Hi, and welcome back to the concluding part of our four-part mini-series on opposition to the Vietnam War in the US. If you haven't listened to parts one to three yet, I'd go back and listen to those first. As part of her anti-war activism, Cora Weiss was involved in a truly groundbreaking piece of work, building links with US prisoners of war, POWs. Different groups of people had different strategies and did engage in different things. I was strictly with Women's Strike for Peace, and I did things with the women, and we were careful not to do anything that our children couldn't join us in, except one thing. We did lay down on, I think, Park Avenue, a very elegant street in New York, in our finest clothing. And we lay on the street and did a, a lion with signs on our bodies with the names of the dead Vietnamese, the dead Americans. Um, that was one protest that we did. We also started, and this is probably the most important thing that I did, a um, subgroup called the Committee of Liaison with servicemen detained in North Vietnam. And that was established in 1969 when I first went to North Vietnam because Nixon was claiming that the war would go on and the bombing would go on for as long as our soldiers were being tortured and taken prisoner. And of course, they wouldn't have been tortured or taken prisoner if we hadn't been sending pilots flying bombers over North Vietnam. But the more we sent, the more were shot down. And the crew, which was usually just a pilot and another person in the back of the plane, uh, were taken prisoner if they survived their crash. So it was a very brilliant move. It was the idea of a nice Quaker man named Stuart Meacham who worked with the American Friends Service Committee. And he said, why don't we try to take that excuse away from Nixon, which was the pretext for continuing the bombing, the fact that it was all about prisoners of war. And of course, the American government didn't know who was a prisoner of war. They had no way of knowing because they weren't talking to the Vietnamese. They were fighting them. And the Red Cross couldn't say who was a prisoner of war because they weren't allowed into North Vietnam. So we created an American citizen group. It was very small. I think there were a half a dozen of us. And we worked with the Women's Union of Vietnam, whom we met in Canada on our most patriotic holiday, July 4th. And we proposed the idea to them, and they invited us to put a delegation of three women together. And following the biggest demonstration that I helped to organize, which was November 15, 1969, in Washington, which, according to the press, was largely responsible for turning public opinion against the war, we left three of us for North Vietnam with mail from American families who thought that their husbands or fathers were prisoners of war. And we gave the mail to the women because you're not allowed to negotiate with a foreign government in a wartime. And the women's union won the day that we left, gave us 300 letters to bring home from the pilots who were in the prison camp. And that was the breakthrough, and women did it. Women Strike for Peace, three of us. Uh, It was an extraordinary breakthrough because it was the first time that there was a beginning list of who, in fact, was alive in a North Vietnamese prison camp. So we were creative and successful, productive. The other unique creative thing that we did was to get the Vietnamese to agree to receive three American 
either strategic opinion makers and or mere mortal citizen activists every month who would bring mail from the families because mail that was being sent through the mail lines was being censored, opened and censored, and then to bring mail back from the pilots. They were mostly pilots. Uh, And that was unique. So every month for three years, I think with the exception of one month when there were severe floods, we brought mail to Vietnam. And by bringing the mail back, we developed a list of who, in fact, was alive in the prison camps. So, you know, I was called a housewife from the Bronx by a number of newspapers in the early days. It took a housewife from the Bronx, that's where we lived, to get a list that the U.S. government couldn't get. So another strategy was to embarrass the government, and we did that frequently. The anti-war movement was doing something that the government couldn't do, and we were, in fact, reassuring and helping families know that their guys were alive. And we were having to tell just a few people, I'm not sure how many, but any few are too many, obviously, um, that their relatives, their father or husband, was no longer alive, or died in, in his chute, uh, his parachuting, or from wounds. The death rate was very small, I must say, in the prison camps. Uh, it was quite a miracle that the Vietnamese kept these guys alive. They fed them a lot of pumpkin because of the vitamin C in it. But while the three Americans were there, they were taken around to see the damage and meet the people, and they came home as eyewitness reporters on the nature of the war. And they would get local publicity in their local, wherever that town they came from, and they would talk to their local newspaper. So all of that had a cumulative effect. It was all, you know, methods thrown into the I shouldn't use the word pot, but uh, thrown into the mix to establish public opinion against the war. And finally, to persuade Congress, which had the power of the purse, to stop funding it. The anti-war movement was also able to score a major propaganda victory in 1972 by achieving something else the U.S. government had failed to do, getting some POWs returned to the U.S., The releases were one or two people at a time, three at the most. I brought home three in in, uh, 1972, and two guys brought home a couple before then, two or three, and they were all anti-war people, that's true, and they were all peace gestures. And when we brought the three home, I had the mother of one, the wife of a second with us, which was extraordinary that they let us bring family. And the third guy, his wife was persuaded by the Department of Defense not to have anything to do with us. So he was Jewish, the prisoner of war, which was unusual. And I'm Jewish, and so the Vietnamese asked me to substitute and escort him out (laughs) because the other two guys had their mother and wife with them. So that was kind of amusing. It was very important because, unfortunately, Kissinger's response to that peace gesture was the horrendous bombing of um, Halong Bay and Hanoi in December, what we called the Christmas bombing. By the end of the 1960s, some student anti-war activists also decided to try to take their activism beyond the campus into the broader working class, including Michael Novick. Yeah, I uh, continued living in New York for about a year. We were involved in uh, some campus organizing, even though I was not officially allowed on campus. 
uh, I eventually moved to California. Uh, I felt like there was a lot more going on there in terms of uh, particularly workplace organizing. And uh, uh, I moved to uh, the Northern California and got involved in something called the Hayward Collective. And the Hayward Hayward is a small town that's uh, kind of south of Oakland. It's one of the industrial suburbs. Uh, that collective had been set up by uh, women who are part of uh, Berkeley Women's Liberation who were interested in, as I was, uh, in doing kind of more base building or grassroots organizing with, uh, you know, more working class people off the campus and particularly, uh, you know, people of European descent to uh, organize them against racism, militarism, sexism. You know, a lot of the things people are still talking about today, we were trying to deal with then. This was like, probably 1969 at that point. And so nationally, there was a big, uh, uh, actually coming out of that experience with the National Student Association, uh, there had been a struggle to to get a more leftly elected in the National Student Association, that which failed, and the person who had been involved in that launched what was called the moratorium. And the moratorium was an effort at having escalating uh, national action, student strikes and other things against the war. And uh, <clears throat> so we were trying to do moratorium organizing in working class communities and kind of at the factory gate. We didn't feel we were in a position to actually, you know, try to get people to go out on strike, but we were doing um, leafleting and, and, you know, different forms of uh, political education. Uh, two people around the moratorium dates about what was going on with the war, what the role of some of those companies were. This was like there were GM plants and Ford plants, uh, Kellogg and a bunch of others that people were working in. And, you know, some of the automotive people are obviously involved also in, in defense uh, contracting. So we were trying to expose the, the links between, you know, industrial conglomerates in the U.S. and, and the war machine and educate people about that, you know, who were involved in factory work, which was not something that, you know, a lot of uh, the student movement, you know, paid attention to at that time. At the same time, many people within Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, the largest student anti-war organization, were starting to think that more militant action was necessary to end the conflict. As the war intensified, there was also a, a, a sharpening struggle inside the left and so a number of people uh, went to, uh, uh, who had been previously involved in the SDS, went to the uh, Flint, Michigan uh, SDS conference that uh, uh, sometimes is referred to as a war council. Uh, it was like uh, people felt that there was a need to intensify the level of struggle going on in the United States uh, against the war as the war intensified. And uh, so uh, there was a faction within SDS at that time called Weatherman, later became the Weather Underground Organization that uh, sent organizers around. They came out to the uh, Hayward Collective, and uh, a number of us joined that uh, sort of organization that was, I can't say it was exactly underground yet, although uh, we began to, uh, you know, I guess lay the groundwork for doing that. Uh, so we were involved in uh, <clears throat> a lot of militant street actions. There were, uh, you know, protests in Berkeley and Oakland uh, against the draft, against the war. Uh, the situation at that time is that a lot of demonstrations would start out seeming like a peaceful rally, but they would be attacked uh, by the police uh, uh, with tear gas and rubber bullets. Uh, so we were, you know, some of us formed up the, uh, People, a lot of people would go to the demonstrations in what were called affinity groups, prepared to uh, deal with those uh, situations, uh, mask up, bring things to protect themselves from tear gas. Uh, people were, you know, were throwing the tear gas canisters back at the police, uh, you know, rock throwing and, and a lot of other stuff like that that went on. And then as stuff deepened, uh, <clears throat> that you get reports of like around the country that there were, you know, there was a lot of mass, uh, uh, I have to call it arm struggle, but people were attacking uh, uh, ROTC, the JROTC facilities. ROTC is Reserve Officer Training Corps. Most campuses at that time and even down to the high school level, they had JROTC, which is Junior uh, Reserve Officer Training Corps. 
And so these were military training programs in the schools. Uh, there were struggles about, you know, other uh, Defense Department contracts with uh, uh, scientists and so on. Uh, so in several uh, cases, there were, uh, uh, as the weather uh, organization began to develop its capacities, uh, you'd read about sort of concerted actions uh, against ROTC. And uh, uh, some of those took place in Berkeley, although very often, for some reason, uh, they were duds in Berkeley. I'm not sure why. But that was not just uh, uh, clandestine groupings doing that. There were, you know, that was an era in which uh, a lot of mass actions took the same form. Uh, and so uh, several, I think the ROTC building on the Berkeley campus was actually burned down because of people, you know, uh, throwing Molotov cocktails at it in a protest. And, and that was not from within the, you know, clandestine organization. That was within uh, the level of intensity of the, of the, mass struggle was going on at that time. One potential flashpoint for confrontation was the Chicago 8 trial. The trial took place from September 1969 to February 1970, of eight people involved in organising protests outside the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, including Black Panther chairman Bobby Seale. Uh, there was a trial for the people who had uh, led the uh, were accused of leading the protests in Chicago against the Democratic uh, Convention in 68. So that trial dragged on for a long time. Uh, that included uh, Tom Hayden, uh, Jerry Rubin, and Abby Hoffman from the Yippies, uh, various other peace activists, David Dellinger, and uh, uh, Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale was separated. He was bound and gagged and, and uh, you know prevented from speaking in the courtroom because of his protest against the kind of uh, racism and, and unjust uh, way in which he was being treated. So there was a demonstration call that was uh, was billed as TDA, uh, stood for the day after. It was, uh, you know, it was in advance of the verdict coming down. In that case, people were saying the day after the verdict, everybody into the streets to protest because we anticipated a guilty verdict. And so, you know, uh, the grouping I was with planned to carry out you know, uh, street actions uh, to raise the level of intensity and struggle, you know, resistance uh, within that context. In the end, Seal was charged with contempt of court, tried separately in jail for four years. In a very surprising verdict, the remaining Chicago Seven were all acquitted by the jury on conspiracy charges, despite the clear hostility displayed toward them and the defence throughout the whole trial. But five of them were jailed for five years for crossing state lines with the intention of inciting a riot, and all of them, as well as their lawyer, were sent to prison for contempt of court. Although in 1972, all these convictions, apart from seals, were reversed in appeals. Elsewhere, thousands of people protesting against the Vietnam War were being violently attacked by the police, beaten and arrested. On the 4th of May 1970, National Guard troops in Ohio opened fire and shot 13 unarmed students at Kent State University, killing four. And just a few days later, city and state police in Mississippi opened fire on protesting black students at Jackson State College, killing two and injuring 12. This caused tensions to escalate significantly. After the Kent State shootings, hundreds of thousands of students went on a student strike and took to the streets in often violent protests, and militancy in general increased. Uh, well, as I say, you know, there was a tremendous level of frustration. On the one hand, we would have these mass, mass rallies, giant demonstrations, and it would have, you know, absolutely no impact on what was happening. The, you know, the, the government would continue to escalate. Uh, it went from Democratic administration to Republican administration, and, you know, the war just continued to increase in intensity, the bombings, the, you know, expansion of the territory that they, you know, knew they were fighting in. Uh, the level of, you know, napalm. And, and so, and through a good deal of that period, the, as I say, the compulsory military service was still in effect. And so you saw within the military itself, there was a lot of uh, resistance and direct action. There, were, there was a whole history of what were called f uh, fraggings. Uh, uh, people would throw fragmentation grenades at their own officers who were, you know, just uh, putting too many people's lives at risk and uh, carrying out too many atrocities. So I think there was a sense that, you know, uh, you saw Vietnam veterans against the war and people coming back and testifying about, you know, crimes against humanity they had participated in and throwing their own medals, you know, off 
So I think the level of uh, awareness of what the U.S. was involved in was much higher then than it is today. Uh, you know, the war was on TV. People could see the villages being bombed and strafed and burned, and thousands of people were coming back dead and wounded. Uh, so there was a, a sense of a level of intensity. There's also a sense of the potential power of people's struggles. I think there were movements going on all over the world. Uh, you know, uh, Che Guevara put out the slogan, two, three, many Vietnam. So there was a sense that, you know, the, the war of the flea was sort of being successful. The U.S., you know, despite all the firepower, it's so that many of these people, their resistance was continuing. You saw struggles in Cambodia and Laos, uh, uh, opening up in different African countries that were still colonized by the Portuguese or, or uh, you know, South Africans and, and Rhodesians who were basically white minority uh, settler colonial governments were, you know, facing uh, struggles at a very high level of intensity from, uh, you know, the people that they were oppressing. So there was a sense that all around the world, uh, people were rising up and putting, uh, you know, the kind of imperialism, militarism, colonialism on a defensive. And uh, you felt like you could be part of that, that you had a responsibility to do something and that, uh, you know, the, there was a capacity to, you know, carry out direct actions or, you know, uh, disrupt the war machine in different ways that would, you know, have an impact on that struggle in a way that uh, just marching around in a circle, at a, you know, at a rally didn't seem to have any effect. But I just saw recently a film, uh, which I saw a few years later then, it came out in 1979, by that point, I, you know, the war was over. I was living in Chicago then. The film was called The War at Home. Uh, and it was about the anti-war movement in Madison, Wisconsin. And it and it showed that arc very clearly. The students, you know, started out, you know, in suits and ties and very politely, you know, raising questions, having teach-ins, you know, starting to educate themselves about what was going on. And, and as the repression of peaceful activities increased and the, the sense of futility uh, at impacting what the government wanted. You saw increasing militants, you saw people fighting back when they were attacked by the police. Uh, the black students on that campus uh, launched the whole struggle of their own, uh, connected to racism with the institution, which you know pushed the white anti-war students to understand that it was not just something going on overseas, but something going on in this country. And then eventually in that context, uh, a small group formed at that campus called the New Year's Gang, and they uh, chartered a private plane and attempted to drop a bomb on a munitions factory uh, out, outside the city of Madison. It didn't have much damage. Eventually, they they blew up the Army Mathematics Research Center on the campus, uh, which was uh, an institution that had uh, you know major contracts with the Defense Department. And the, although it sounds kind of innocuous, what's mathematics? But they were basically involved in trying to figure out, you know the mathematics of, of uh, mass murder or the mathematics of, uh, you know, how to uh, subvert anti-colonial organizing in, in Vietnam, how many people you had to impact or, you know, uh, how to figure out who the key organizers were. Even protests by pacifist activists escalated and they began taking more confrontational forms of action. COINTELPRO an FBI operation Michael mentions here was a series of efforts by the agency to undermine black liberation, anti-war and revolutionary movements through a number of underhand methods, including infiltration, disruption, sabotage and even assassination. Yeah, I, I think one of the things is that, uh, you know, a lot of the people in the pacifist wing, they were not going to carry out armed actions, but they were prepared to carry out illegal actions and sometimes uh, face arrest and sometimes avoid arrest. So, for example, the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of the burglary. People's awareness of the whole COINTELPRO operation of the FBI grew out of a group of pacifists who had been involved with uh, the uh, Berrigan brothers, uh, uh, who were Catholic, you know, uh, war resistors uh, doing uh, anti-draft, anti-war. They would uh, throw blood on draft files. And, you know, so these were, you know, pacifists, but they were, quite militant and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, strong in their resistance. The particular group that uh, came out of that uh, carried out a break-in at the FBI offices in Media, Pennsylvania. 
And uh, so they were a clandestine group. Uh, they were pacifists. They were anti-war and uh, anti-draft. And uh, they broke in looking for files. Uh, originally, they were looking for files related to uh, uh, draft resistors and thought they could disrupt possible prosecutions. Uh, they ended up taking every single file out of the FBI office and discovered uh, a massive snitch network, for one thing. They found that the, uh, and they released files, you know, steadily to the media uh, from clandestinity. They were never caught, they were never identified until they finally came forward decades later. Uh, so I think that pacifism had a much different uh, aspect to it than it does these days. So, you know, Martin Luther King was a pacifist, but he spoke out very, very strongly uh, against the war. And the civil rights movement uh, at that time was engaged in, you know, massive civil disobedience and mass arrests and defying uh, legality uh, and unjust laws. So I think that there was a, a, a sense of uh, common purpose and commonality uh, because the level of uh, militants and of struggle was quite intense among people who were, you know, committed to nonviolence as a strategy or philosophy in a different way than they are today. So I, I think that uh, a lot of people who talk about nonviolence today basically are saying, well, let's just have, you know, a demonstration. The people who were, you know, engaging at that time or even during the Central American Wars, there was still a sense of, of uh, preparing to disrupt uh, the order of things. So, you know, people know the case of, uh, um, I think of Brian's last name, but uh, he lost his legs. He, he was uh, trying to stop a, a, a military munitions train at, in the Concord uh, facility in Northern California that was uh, shipping uh, arms into Central America. The train ran over him and cut his legs off. And uh, so people were prepared, uh, you know, who were nonviolent resistance at that time to engage in a level of resistance that, you know, uh, puts most of us to shame. So I think that there was much more cross fertilization in those days and a sense of, um, they say, people were prepared to, you know, break unjust laws and, and to operate uh, from clandestinity, uh, which I think is important. I, I think that recognizing the state is going to infiltrate movements and try to disrupt them. And even if you're committed to nonviolence, it uh, doesn't exempt you from that threat and uh, provocateurs and other things. So I think that, uh, you know, there was much more cohesion in that sense. I mean, you know, there's a range, obviously, of activity in every sphere of the movement, every sector of the movement. But uh, I think that uh, pacifists and nonviolent uh, you know, people who committed nonviolence are much more actually uh, open to different forms of direct action as long as they were not, uh, you know, physically destructive or attacking people uh, at that time than they are today as well. As we mentioned before, industrial disputes also began to have an impact on the war effort. But I think that uh, one of the factors at that time as well is that there was... Um, Although people are more aware of sort of hard hats supporting the war and construction workers, but there was a level of labor militancy as well that also was influenced by the anti-war movement and by the black liberation circle. So I talked about the fact that we were, you know, uh, at the factory gates with uh, a moratorium on the war, but we were also uh, supporting, you know, labor uh, struggles and strikes that were going on in that area. Uh, there was a big influence uh, in the uh, auto industry in particular, uh, from the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, uh, uh, had uh, groups called DRUM and LRUM, is the Dodge uh, Revolutionary Union Movement. These were like black-led, but not exclusively black formations that were frustrated with uh, the labor bureaucracy and with the kind of deals that were being cut between the uh, unions and management that it were not, you know, touching issues of racism within the plant or, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, hierarchies within the labor movement that, you know, favored certain uh, elements of labor at the expense of a lot of other working people. As a reminder, we talk more about the wartime strike wave in our podcast episode seven and about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in episode 12. But in general, a real strength of the movement was that different wings while disagreeing on tactics, still had a basic level of solidarity with one another. Yes, 
because if you didn't like their tactic, you didn't join their thing. But in the end, the mobilization, which had many names, right? There was the new mobilization, the spring mobilization, the mobile mobilization, uh, because they happened in different seasons. And what they represented was large demonstrations. And if you wanted a large demonstration, you had to bring everybody into the, to the table, whether you liked them or not. While this was going on, Michael ended up parting ways with the Weather Underground faction of SDS. The Weather Underground went on to carry out numerous attacks in protest against the Vietnam War and in solidarity with the Black Liberation Movement. For example, they carried out a number of bombings of US military and government facilities, including the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., other attacks also took place, organised by other urban guerrilla groups which arose at the same time, as well as those organised by individuals or informal groups. Uh, what happened with me personally in that whole uh, tendency is that the weather underground got a lot more serious and went deeper uh, underground and cut a lot of people loose. I was one of them. I think I was not really part of the core group of people who had come up together in it, I had no particular resources to contribute as compared to a lot of them who came out of, you know, very well-to-do families and had networks of, uh, you know, people prepared to support them. So I got cut loose, as they called it, and uh, was no longer part of it after uh, they, you know, kind of intensified their level of of clandestinity. Uh, So I went briefly back to New York and I came back to California again. And by that time was uh, roughly the era of the uh, uh, Nixon expanded the war into Cambodia and Laos. And so I connected up with uh, people who uh, basically took over uh, a school. It was called the California College of Arts and Crafts in North Oakland. Basically took all the resources of the campus and turned them into making anti-war posters. You know, that could be spread around. Uh, We were involved in... uh, kind of repurposing billboards. Uh, I remember one that people climbed up a billboard that uh, had the slogan, everybody needs milk, which was a popular uh, advertising slogan at that time for the dairy industry. And we changed it to everybody needs peace. Uh, we helped silkscreen shrouds for the uh, 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 funeral of uh, uh, George Jackson. Maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it was for Jonathan Jackson, because I think it was for 70 and then, uh, George was killed until 71. George Jackson was a member of the Black Panther Party, who was one of a group known as the Soledad Brothers, a group of black inmates at the San Quentin prison accused of killing a white guard. In 1970, his 17-year-old brother Jonathan took part in an armed invasion of the Marin County Courthouse in California, demanding the release of the Soledad Brothers. In the ensuing shootout, Jonathan Jackson was killed, as was a judge. George himself was killed the following year in San Quentin prison during an escape attempt. As a slight aside, Jonathan Jackson's guns were actually registered to a famous black communist, Angela Davis, who was subsequently prosecuted, but later acquitted of all charges after a sensational trial. We've got a collection of her writings about this available on our webpage for this episode. Link in the show notes. Initially, many radicals had a gung-ho attitude to the repression, but eventually it took its toll. And as usually happens in democratic countries, alongside the repression went recuperation. At the time, we had a slogan, repression breeds resistance, but I I don't think that that actually is true. Unless you can figure out uh, clear ways to deal with the repression and and build a resistance, uh, repression eventually does lead to... uh, Surrender. Uh, I, I think you know they were very effective at at, at targeted repression, particularly. And the reason I, I emphasized before the role of the black struggle is that the level of repression and the intensity of the state operations against the black liberation movement, the Chicano struggle. In other words, like one of the leading uh, anti-war things in California was called the Chicano Moratorium, and so uh, Chicanos were uh, you know Mexican Americans. Uh, Mexican migrants in the United States uh, who were disproportionately dying in the war. And so they had a uh, an anti-war march. It was attacked by the sheriffs, uh, predominantly L- L.A. Sheriff's Department. 
and disrupted. And then, uh, you know, different leaders of that movement were picked off, uh, uh, people both involved in the uh, high school student movement and in the community struggle were targeted for, you know, uh, criminal trials, uh, conspiracy trials, uh, and the black liberation struggle. So the same thing, the Black Panther Party was, you know, uh, the target of, of uh, military level assaults in, in various cities, including here in Los Angeles. Uh, but in Chicago and around the country, you know, people were killed, people were imprisoned. And I, I think, you know, they had a sort of uh, effective, the state had an effective strategy of sort of, uh, you know, cut off the head. Uh, so they, they went after people like, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Seale, uh, uh, Erica Huggins, uh, Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago and in other uh, similar types of organizations around the country. And I think that had a, a withering impact eventually on resistance. Uh, you know, the, it did disorient. They, they created a lot of uh, disunity and uh, internal struggle within the Black Liberation Movement and, and factionalization that was promoted by uh, agents uh, in place and by different FBI uh, dirty tricks, writing letters from one to the other, you know, accusing them of things that the letters are actually written by the FBI, but pretending to be people in factions. And you saw the same thing in the Chicano struggle. There were a, a series of um, essentially assassinations in the early 70s in the Chicano student movement in uh, Colorado. There were, you know, as I say, arrests here in uh, LA. There was a similar uh, thing uh, in the Bay Area. So, case called Los Siete de la Raza. They were like, uh, you know, Mexican-American and Central American. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think that, that that level of repression eventually, uh, you know, at the start of it, I think it, it did, uh, you know, people uh, fought back, but uh, eventually I think it did, uh, you know, break uh, a lot of those movements. And, and I think without the leading edge of, you know, those liberation struggles inside the United States, uh, I think also the, the, you know, they talk about the carrot and the stick. So it was, you know, the other part of it was co-optation. They did abolish the draft and go to an all, uh, volunteer army. And they were able to find enough people, you know, who bought into the, the mission of the U.S. military to, uh, you know, fill its ranks without drafting people, without compulsory military service. So I think there's two factors, which was, uh, you know, targeted repression that, that effectively you know, demoralized, uh, particularly the liberation movements inside the U.S. And then uh, co-optation, uh, they, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people kind of, as the war ended and the movement was became somewhat irrelevant uh, as an anti-war movement and did not want to become an anti-imperialist movement, the people kind of made their separate peace. They joined uh, different nonprofit organizations and then, you know, kind of lost the the mass base and went in favor of you know sort of forming these board and staff organizations where you know people had jobs and careers doing good work or something but it wasn't connected to really a grassroots base and a movement that was you know organizing to change the world it was uh, providing social services and you know following the money that grant writers would uh, seek from foundations or you know wealthy individuals. So I think that uh, we haven't recovered from that yet. I think that's still the predominant, uh, you know, that, and as you say, party politics, people, you know, just look to uh, the electoral system, uh, which I don't think, uh, I think it's mostly been the graveyard of those kind of uh, mass movements and particularly of militants and uh, resistance. I know they're using the slogan resistance now, but it doesn't seem like the kind of resistance that existed uh, in that period. By, uh, by a long shot. Despite the repression, the movement against the Vietnam War, combined with events on the ground, did successfully turn public opinion against US involvement in the region. From only around 10% of the population supporting US withdrawal in 1965, this grew to 50% in 1970, and up to 70% or more by 1971. Yeah, and our, our goal was to convince the majority of Americans that this war was wrong, and I think it happened not just because of us, but I think we undermined any kind of consensus that supported this brutal war. 
And I think that's why it ended. Plus, the Vietnamese just would not give up. Eventually, with an ever-increasing death toll of US troops and facing the absolute determination of North Vietnamese and National Liberation Front forces, Republican President Richard Nixon was forced to sign a peace agreement with North Vietnam. Undoubtedly, the primary reason for this was the failure of the US military to defeat the anti-colonial struggle of the Vietnamese people. But US service people being increasingly unwilling to fight and constant protests and turbulence at home were also factors in forcing Nixon to the table. Under the 1973 Paris Peace Agreement, US troops would be withdrawn and US prisoners of war were returned. The US did try to keep propping up its unpopular and violent puppet regime in South Vietnam by providing it with military aid in a process it called Vietnamization. But after Nixon resigned in the Watergate scandal, Vice President Gerald Ford took power. And while Congress had agreed $700 million in funding for the South Vietnamese military, Ford requested an additional $300 million, but Congress refused it, and the South Vietnamese regime quickly collapsed. Eventually, on the 30th of April 1975, around a century of colonial occupation of Vietnam, by France, by Japan, by France again, and then finally by the US, came to an end. Well, I mean, the war ended, and it took everything to make it end, to get it to end. Uh, it took all of the strategies that we've mentioned, eyewitness reporting, bringing home prisoners, encouraging the mail, marching in the streets, uh, defying the draft, getting your members of Congress to vote against uh, funding. I mean, it took teach-ins. It took every kind of person and every kind of activity. And all of those things eventually got Congress in the, la in the end to say, no, no more money. And that did it. And that took 10 years and 55,000 American lives and maybe one or two million, I don't know what the official figure is, Vietnamese lives and then Cambodian lives and Laotian lives with those terrible landmines. So it took a lot to end that war, which should never have happened and was immoral and illegal. It could not have ended without the movement. I mean, look at Afghanistan. How many years has it been? It's the longest running war. And there's no anti-Afghan war movement. Now the war keeps going on and on. And people are being killed unnecessarily. And lands and homes and families are being destroyed unnecessarily. Because it's, we've demonstrated with the Afghan war that war doesn't work. And I'm not an ideological pacifist, but I'm sure as hell I am a nuclear pacifist, and I just don't think we've had a just war since the end of the Second World War. While the U.S. war on Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos eventually ended, it left a legacy of destruction and devastation in the region. I mean, the consequences are now generational. The second and third generations are suffering from the Vietnam War because their parents were hit with Agent Orange or because their daddies and mommies got PTSD and couldn't take care of the children. I don't know. It's just, war is just wrong. U.S. Imperial Project suffered a major setback in Vietnam, and so this forced a rethink and change of strategy in the coming decades. So I think that the uh, the intensity of the war itself, the duration of the war, the the inadequate uh, nature of just peaceful protests that uh, had no material impact on the operations of the war. Uh, and I think those lessons have uh, continued. Uh, you saw the same thing happen with uh, you know there was what was called the Vietnam Syndrome. You know the level of opposition inside the United States and inside the military. Uh, became so intense that the United States actually stepped back from the kind of military interventionism that they had been engaging in in Korea, Vietnam, elsewhere for a period of time. And then they had to kind of rebuild and refashion a consensus that would allow the U.S. to intervene militarily. So they started small with like, you know, Grenada and Panama 
and then moved on to the wars in Central America where they were proxy wars. They, you know, there were fewer U.S. troops involved, but there was a lot of U.S. military assistance. Eventually, that was uh, stopped. In recent wars, like the one in Iraq, the U.S. government learned from its experiences in Vietnam. And it and the war in Afghanistan were also different because they were officially declared wars. But, you know, the, the military in the United States is no longer allowing journalists to go. They have to be embedded with military units because they don't want journalists to get the truth out. And in a declared war, it's very hard for civilians to go and meet with the people from the country involved. Vietnam was an undeclared war. They could not stop us from going to Vietnam. They took our passports away, but they could not arrest us for doing that. But in a declared war, it's a different situation. So the ability now for ordinary people to get real information and for journalists to get real information about weapons and strategies on the ground and the impact on civilians, it's much harder. Michael thinks that there were some problems in the movements of the 60s and 70s, which we can learn from and improve on today. Um, I think my own personal experience was, uh, and I don't think that's unique, I think it was uh, frustrating in a lot of ways. I think that there's a, a tremendous potential of the movements, but I think that um, people on the left often don't treat themselves or each other very well. I think that, you know, something out of a sense of urgency and the sense of antagonism towards the enemy. But uh, I, I think the other thing we need to work on is that sense of solidarity and that sense of taking care of ourselves and each other without losing the edge or the, the, the militants. I, I think people haven't figured that out very well yet. I think it, it tends to fluctuate or be one or the other. And so I think the people who talk a lot about self-care and, uh, you know, our concerns for how we deal with each other in the movement uh, don't always have the, the the other piece of it and vice versa. The people who are focused on, uh, you know, militant action and, you know, fighting hard uh, uh, sometimes don't develop their uh, other emotional capacities so I, I do look to certain movements that I've seen that, that have handled that better. I think that uh, a lot of the, uh, the the Puerto Rican independence struggle, the Chicano movement in particular, and I see it now more in the black struggle. You see like Black Lives Matter. Uh, they talk a lot about black love, you know. And uh, so I think that that, I think that's developing. But I, I think that uh, among people of European descent, especially, uh, we need to figure out how to uh, to sort of divide the aspects of ourselves that are tied into the system with the aspects of ourselves that, you know, really want a different and better world and figure out how to, you know, struggle in an uncompromising way with the system, but at the same time in a uh, uh, uplifting way <laughs> with each other. And in retrospect, he has some criticism of his own actions and those of the Weather Underground faction. Uh, you know, I think uh, I have mixed feelings about my own participation in some of the things they did. I think that they had too much of a uh, uh, my way or the highway, you know, uh, attitude towards the rest of the left uh, to the extent that, that uh, they kind of disrupted, you know, other left activities that were not consistent with their view. So I think that that was an error on their part. And uh, later they, they uh, you know, a lot of them surfaced one way or another. They're still around uh, Mark Rudd. Uh, you know, Bernadine Dorn and a lot of the leadership, uh, have, you know, are now living regular lives. And uh, compared to, you know, some of the other people involved in that type of activity in that era, I think that the uh, weather people probably got off uh, fairly easy and fairly light. I mean, uh, certainly compared to, uh, you know, people in the Black Liberation Movement or uh, Chicano struggles, Puerto Rican movements, where there were, you know, assassinations and, you know, people. Uh, locked up, you know, for, uh, we're still locked away uh, to this day uh, from the Black Liberation Movement. So, and there there are a few uh, people that I knew from that period that uh, David Gilbert is one, and he's, you know, probably going to be in prison the rest of his life, uh, but he's somewhat unique among the white prisoners 
who did, uh, you know, get caught for anti-imperialist, anti-war activities. Most of the rest were uh, eventually released. Michael also cautions that we should try to ensure that direct action movements should still relate to our everyday lives and experiences. Yeah, I, I do think that somehow uh, the militants and the direct action has to be connected to a sense of engagement with people's lives and a connection between uh, what people are experiencing day to day and the rest of the operations of the empire. And I think all of that is actually much clearer today than it was then. You know, at that time, uh, people had the illusion that, you know, we were living high on the hog. And I think that uh, uh, 40 or 50 years of economic stagnation, actually, and, and uh, you know, uh, two or three rounds of uh, economic crisis have uh, disillusioned a lot of people. So I think that we have to, today, I think we need two things. We need to, as I say, connect the idea of direct action with, uh, you know, the conditions that people are living under, but also we have to give people a sense of uh, capacity or power to deal with the problems themselves. I think that uh, you know, the resistance aspects of it have to be connected to, uh, you know, solidarity and liberation, a sense that, uh, you know, people can, uh, you know, people talk about prefigurative things and those people can organize uh, uh community gardens and food co-ops and, and uh, you know, cooperative housing and rent strikes and other mechanisms that are um, uh, sort of capacity building so that you have a basis from which you're resisting. For Vivian, one of the lasting legacies of the Vietnam War is the widespread lack of trust in authorities, which persists today. Well, I think one... One legacy, which is good and bad, is that because of the Vietnam War, a lot of people stopped trusting the American government. And um, many of us felt the government was not telling us the truth. And now, of course, it's come out that they, they weren't, that they knew that this was a popular war and not a war engineered by communist forces from Russia or China. They knew all of that stuff. They didn't tell us the truth. And and I think as a result, a lot of people don't trust the, the government at all. And I think the government is our collective vehicle for running the government in a democracy. And I think we outed the government and the people responsible. But I think we need to have faith that we can we can vote in a government that can do the people's will and can tell the truth and um it's a little harder now cuz people are cynical and i think some of that cynicism donald trump used to get elected and uh demagogues used to get that elected you know the government is terrible it's just a big corrupt bureaucracy it wants to take your freedom away all of those messages well, that they fall on somewhat receptive ears because a lot of people lost trust in government as a result of the Vietnam War. So there's good and bad that have come out of it. It's complicated. It's complicated. But I think that that's one of the bad legacies. A good legacy is that for Americans in contemporary America, they do have some, and this is why Ken Burns fell short, he could have really educated people about what people did to build a broad-based majoritarian movement and how hard it is, but how people did it and shared some of those skills because people want those skills right now. Ken Burns is a documentary maker who recently made a series on the Vietnam War, but Vivian feels he left out a lot. Well, I think he could have gotten across um, the kind of organizing and agitation that went in within almost every American institution about the war in Vietnam, certainly within every religious denomination, with, within every college campus, within professional associations, including medical and academic associations. You know, organizations and people stood up, made statements, lobbied their congressional representatives, worked on elections to get rid of some people, put other people in, 
there was a whole generation of people who went to Congress who came out of the anti-war movement and were very important. Um, you know, people learned how to organize. Of course, now there's a new generation needing to learn how to organize and using a lot of new techniques in terms of communications and things. But um, I think they have a legacy that they can draw on. And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. It's uh, very important in general, but I think it's important right now because uh, there's so much dissatisfaction and upset about the direction of our country. And, you know, the easiest thing is for people to just give up and just focus on their personal lives and be hopeless. So uh, hearing about movements and actually the excitement and the the profound impact of being involved in these kinds of things could be an inspiration for people to get involved now. For Michael, unfortunately, recent wars show that many of us haven't learned the lessons of Vietnam. So I think, unfortunately, that has faded. And, uh, we, you know, people today need to relearn the lesson that you see the U.S. carrying out, you know, wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, you know, uh, supporting the Saudis in, in Yemen, uh, you know, the military operations all across Africa. And unfortunately, there's not uh, a commensurate anti-war movement on any level, uh, not even a peaceful one, let alone, you know, militant uh, direct action, protests against those things. So I think that uh, you know, a new generation, unfortunately, will have to learn the same way we did, that uh, it's a, it's an empire. And, and uh, here at home or abroad, it's, uh, you know, the, the anti-democratic, militaristic, uh, you know, repressive apparatuses have to be challenged and confronted. There was a massive, massive global opposition to the war in Iraq until the war in Iraq started. And then it became a fait accompli. In the U.S. in particular, it's like, the anti-war movement evaporated. Uh, I don't know what it was like in other places, but uh, in the United States, it was like people sort of threw up their hands and said, oh, well, you know, they're ignoring us. We have these giant anti-war protests and it didn't have any, didn't make any difference, but instead of escalating their tactics and increasing their struggle, they wanted to vote for somebody else. But, you know, they got Obama who, you know, continued most of it uh, for another eight years without effective opposition. The United States today has become an increasingly divided society, which in many ways mirrors the situation in the 1960s. So it was a period of of a lot of organizing, a lot of hopefulness, and a lot of agony, because watching the news every night, you saw people being killed in Vietnam in a war that our government never voted on and was was, you know, recruiting, drafting our friends and pretty much destroying the consensus in the country. So it was very painful, but uh, it was a time of activism. It, it's a little bit like it is right now. There's a lot of pain in the United States about our current leadership, but there are people who are becoming active and organizing groups in their own communities, in their churches, in their schools, and feeling they need to take action. Things are so bad that they need to take action. So it's an exciting time also. And it was very much like that in the late 60s. We thought we'd conclude today's episode with these parting words from Cora Weiss. I also wanted to say that the anti-war movement doesn't belong to any one group or any one group of people. It really was a huge, diverse, not diverse enough, but diverse movement of different kinds of people with different tactics and different strategies and different... But all had one thing in common, and that was to end the war. I think war is now the issue, and the legacy is there should be war no more. This brings us to the end of our four-part miniseries on U.S. opposition to the Vietnam War. If you enjoyed it, why not check out the rest of our Vietnam War series? In episode 14, 
we talked to Noam Chomsky about the geopolitics of the conflict. In episodes 10 and 11, we talked to veterans about the GI resistance. In episodes 21 24, we talked to a mutineer on a US military supply ship. And in episode 7, we talk about the strike wave during the war. There's also a very brief mini episode attached to this one, with just a couple of clips we weren't able to fit into the main episodes. Our Patreon supporters can listen to that now. Our work on this mini series over the last two years has been made possible by listeners like you supporting us on Patreon. In return, patrons get access to exclusive benefits like early access to episodes, bonus content, free and discounted books, merch, and more. So if you can, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. If you can't, absolutely no worries. But if instead you could take a moment to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or share our episodes on social media, that would also be very much appreciated. Check out our webpage for this episode for more info about our interviewees and more. Link in the show notes. Finally, thanks to all of our existing patrons who make this podcast and the Working Class History Project more generally possible. Thanks to Jesse French for editing this miniseries, and thanks to all of you for listening. To conclude this episode, we're going to play the entirety of our theme music for this miniseries, They Couldn't Stand By, by David Rovix. story everyone should know it happened half century ago all across this sprawling nation the rising of a generation it started slow and then gained speed nobody knew where it would lead first there were marches then there were more way too many to keep score they shut down classes couldn't learn once they ascertained how napalm burned they had to find out how to defy people stood up stand by there were parades held by the military brass there were cities filled with cs gas real wars war games recruitment centers up in flames light a match then in a flash draft cards turned to ash thousands moved across the border Refusing military orders Every army base in the USA Had an anti-war cafe There are times when you just can't comply People stood up Cause they couldn't stand by Soldiers insisted on free will Put down their guns, refused to kill Newspapers of the underground Ubiquitously could be found Across the country, across the sea Throughout the ranks of the military Take a grenade, pull out the pin Praise be to Ho Chi Minh Another fragging every night A war that many refused to fight Bombs were falling, some asked why People stood up Cause they couldn't stand by Ruling classes with all their powers Shook inside their ivory towers They were brought to their knees back then That's why we don't have the draft again Even back then, some of them knew They had to be careful what they tried to do Rulers who miscalculate Can lose control of their ship of state In order to govern you need consent And all of that just up and went In 68 came the reply People stood up Cause they couldn't stand by People stood up because they couldn't stand by. People stood up because they couldn't stand by.